Okay, so I guess I'll get started now. I'm Gregory Brown, I'm from New Haven, and I have to start with an apology because the contrast on this screen really sucks. Uh, so I had originally gone through all the trouble of using the syntax highlighting from TextMate, but now you're just gonna see standard black on white, and I'm sorry about that. So this talk is on Ruby Mendicant, which is really about Prawn and what I've been doing over the last six months. Ruby Mendicant was essentially a grassroots funding project for hacking on free and open source software. And it started with this post that I wrote when I was just in the middle of a contracting job that was particularly boring me at the time. And I was completely joking. And what I said is that there's a lot of projects that I would like to work on, but because I have to work for a living, obviously, uh, I don't have time to do it. And there's some projects that you could do as side projects and other projects that require a decent amount of dedicated time to just even get off the ground. So people eventually took it seriously and the short story is that I got enough funding to take 22 weeks off of work, which is great. And I decided to spend it on Prawn, which is a PDF generation library that's designed to become the PDF generation library for Ruby. I'm gonna put a bunch of material up on this web page, and there's already the slides and some other things and some kind of background material. Now, my talk description kind of covered a lot of different things, but as far as what's coming from me, I only wanna talk about three things. And we'll have some time in the end where I can either show some examples or answer some questions or do kind of whatever we wanna do here. So the three topics I want to talk about is being a hippie, because you pretty much have to be to take six months off of work and live off of just living expenses to do free software. Uh, I want to talk about the bare internals of Prawn, because, okay, most of you will never need to do low-level PDF generation, but it's very likely that at some point in your career or in your hobbyist background, you're going to have to approach something big like PDF. I mean, PDF was a 1,310 page specification. And the pattern that I'll show is possibly useful for if you're attacking different problems with a similar feel to them. But of course, I think some of the people here are here to see the shiny outside of Prawn, what you can do with it now, and where it's heading, and things like that. But before I get into the technical side of things, I want to give you a tiny backstory. Aside from Ruby, I've got three main hobbies. I play Go, I homebrew beer, and I study Buddhism. The only thing about that that's relevant is the part about studying Buddhism. I'm sure that some of the people here are saying, shit, it's going to be a philosophical talk now. Uh, but that's not the case. I just want to give a background of where Ruby Mendicant came in the first place. So Buddhism, like many other religions, has this concept of generosity. But what I find fascinating about it is that it became this sort of interesting system for supporting people who want to do things that are good for a community. So throughout Asia, there are tons of what they call wandering mendicants who basically have vowed to take a vow of poverty and just study spiritual life. And the community believes that these people are beneficial to them and that they do things that help them. So they give them food and sustenance so that they can do their things. Even in the West, Buddhist teachers who teach meditations retreats and also you know, run talks and things like that, they typically don't run on any sort of, they, they don't typically charge for any of that stuff. It's all entirely on donation. What's interesting is out of that, you end up with something that becomes a true meritocracy, where if someone is not producing something that people perceive of as value, they are not supported and therefore can't continue doing what they're doing. But the people who do bring something to people that they appreciate can easily uh, make their way. Of course, Ruby is not a religion, and it shouldn't be. People do open source for a lot of reasons, and that's awesome. You don't need an ethical reason to be doing open source hacking. You could do it for fun. You could do it for profit for your company, whatever it is. That's, I think that's great, and it's what keeps our ecosystem so diverse. But my reason is that I want to help people. Now, I don't really know that much about religion, despite the fact I study it, or pretty much anything else, but I'm pretty good at Ruby. 
So that's why we have Ruby Mendicant. And what's really nice is that lots of people helped me. This is the list of donors. And there was a total of 70 of them. Plus, Ruby Central and Mountain West Ruby Conference did some donation matching. These are the people who essentially allowed me to take a half a year out of my life and dedicate it to doing things for the Ruby community. Now, it's worth mentioning that these folks, they had an idea of some of the projects that I wanted to work on, but this was not a bounty system. This was me saying, I've got a few ideas what I want to do, and I'm open to accepting other ideas. Please give me money so that I could take the time off and then decide what to do. So a lot of these people put trust in me without knowing for sure what they were going to get in return, which I think is fantastic. What's amazing is that Prawn has had a tremendous amount of support non-monetarily. On the left column here, you can see all of these people have patches to Prawn. I mean, you're talking about a PDF library, which I thought would be untouchable until it got to the super high level. But all these people have been helping out over the last six months, and it's been amazing. The logos you've seen in here were also contributed by the community. Now, one person I want to give a specific thanks to is James Healy. I don't know, is anyone familiar with who he is? Okay, so James Healy was a former developer on Ruby Reports, and he's also the person who wrote PDF Reader. Because PDF Reader exists, Prawn has specs. Uh, it was originally an R spec, we moved to test spec. But we can actually test the output that we're doing, which I think we may be the only PDF library in Ruby that's doing that. He's also been the one that goes forward and pretty much does all of the exploratory work. I mean, if, if you like doing things like embedding images or using Unicode in your PDFs, he's the guy who started that stuff and then I sort of followed along and just solidified it a bit. So without these people, Prawn would not exist. So I'd like to give them a round of applause. So the question is, if you're going to take six months off of work, why work on such an awful project like PDF generation? And the answer is complicated, but it mainly boils down to I needed convincing. And the person to convince me was uh, James Gray. Now, I imagine most of you have heard of them if we see a show of hands. OK. Yeah. So. James knows my situation, which is that I've been working on Ruport for all of this time, and that we're working fighting against PDF Writer to do the things that we needed to do. And he wrote this really, really awesome essay about how it's OK to let software die. And he wrote this about PDF Writer, and this is ultimately what uh, determined what I wanted to do. This is the last sort of meta stuff in the talk, and then we'll move on to code. But I'd like to read this first. This is from James Gray. He says, I think we should let PDF Writer die. Why single out a specific library? Just because I'm fairly familiar with some details of it. It's nothing personal, and the message behind this post is intended to apply to many projects. For example, the Ruby core team has publicly stated that they want to see the standard CGI.RB library replaced. I'm sure we all feel that way about some software. I'll stick with PDF Writer, and you can me mentally replace it with a project you are familiar with. Now back to the point. I think we should let PDF Writer die. I guess that sounds kind of drastic, but give me a chance to explain. There's a great, great quote that Matts, the creator of Ruby, showed on a slide in a talk he gave to Google recently. It said, open source software should move forward or die. That's an important truth. Why are Matts and I so ready to start handing out the destruction? The reason is not at all complicated. A project can get to the point where it's hindering more than it's helping. I believe PDF Writer is there. I have utmost respect for Austin and his work to build PDF Writer. Back then, it was a welcome effort. Today is a different time, though, and the landscape has changed. For instance, Austin no longer keeps up PDF Writer. PDF Writer's new maintainers, more like patch appliers, don't completely understand the system. He was talking about me there, which is. But there are several known issues that just aren't practical fix to fix for various reasons. PDF Writer is vast and complex code base. There are serious performance issues. The API is far from ideal and it would be a substantial effort to port it to Ruby 1.9. If we put all this together, the picture becomes clear. PDF Writer has stopped moving forward, as Matt's put it. It's on life support. 
That's worse than being dead because it means we're burning valuable effort to keep things in this obviously less than ideal state. Now, if we could just get the coroner to call the time of death for a PDF writer, we can move on. Where would we go next? Who knows? Anywhere is better, though, because we would again be moving forward. Some options we might explore in the immediate future are using a different format, such as RTF, piping some HTML through HTML with PS, Prince XML. The fact is, we've used all three of those options in production applications at work within the last two years. None of them are perfect. Prince is amazing, but so is the price tag. HTML to PS is just shy of being as useful as we'd love it to be in some areas. If you really need PDF, substituting is probably just not an option. That said, all three of these support our needs better than PDF Writer. Perhaps the only viable long-term solution is a shiny and sleek rewrite of PDF Writer. We know we have at least a few people interested in the project, so if we could free them up from monitoring the life support systems, we might just have the beginning of a rebirth effort. That's the way we need to get things moving. The moral is simple. It is not just okay to let PDF Writer or whatever project die. It could actually be a blessing. Sure, we would mourn the loss of once great resource, but eventually we would also choose to move on. That's for the good of us all. And that's why I've been spending six months doing PDF stuff. So that's enough of this sort of intro stuff. I want to talk about the bare internals now. OK, so this is the most trivial example that I could come up with. It's drawing a line from the top left to the bottom right of a page with respect to the margins. Now, right now in Prawn, that's absolutely trivial to do. It can't get more simple if we read it in English. Prawn document generate lines.pdf. Stroke a line from the bounds top left to the bounds top bottom right. OK, does anyone see a way that that could be better? OK. But when we look at what it actually generates, PDF is non-trivial. So on the left-hand side here, you've got things that are pretty much going to be in every PDF, just sort of metadata and a container for the pages and things like that. On the right side, we've got the sort of stuff that were actually the work that we need to do that was specific to this problem. So when we look at this, we could sort of decipher it. OK. so. Ignoring the first four lines, when you see the 000RG, 000 uppercase RG, does anyone have any venture of a guess what that might be? Color? Yeah, color, right on. So the first one is the stroke color, the second one's the fill color. Okay, so Q and uh, uppercase Q are actually things that save and restore the graphic state. So this allows you to move to somewhere in the document, do something, and then just wipe all of that and then just kind of stay where you were before you did that. So inside of that block, we've got something that's 36, 756 M, and then 576, 36 L, and then S. So who wants to guess what that first line's doing? The 36, 756 M. Right, it's moving to a position. So PDF actually works sort of like turtle graphics. You say, move here, then move somewhere else, and then you know, draw something. So the next one is actually creating the path that's going to the bottom of the document. And then the S actually strokes the path. So in PDF, you're generating basically point to point to point, and then you say, OK, fill this in. On the right-hand side, does anyone want to guess what the media box represents? Page size, right on. So obviously we don't have to manually put that stuff in, in Prawn, but you guys have just pretty much seen and understood what a PDF looks like. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this is to show sort of what it's like to build up on top of this stuff. So letting Prawn handle the positioning and the pages, we could actually manually do the line drawing here. So you can see that just using some you know, string substitution, formatted string sub substitution, we've got a move, we've got a draw path, and then a stroke. So this is equivalent to what you saw before. Now the interesting thing here is that you don't need to dig into the internals to do it. If you know some PDF operations that you need to eval, so say you need to add some functionality, it's pretty easy to do it in Prawn. You could do it in a subclass meaningfully. Now, this is a little bit more hardcore. 
right now, the thing that it's only doing is the stuff that was on the left-hand side originally, the stuff that's part of every PDF. Here, we're manually creating a PDF page object. And if you look at the parameters that we're passing here, they look very similar to what you actually see in that sort of raw output. But of course, don't ever, ever do this. The real point is that PDF is hard. And these low-level APIs help make it easier for contributors to come in and build stuff with us. So going farther down the bunny hole, you can see that you've pretty much got support all the way down. This is actually building low-level objects from scratch. We give them an ID, and then we give them some Ruby code. And you can see that they produce your PDF objects. Now, the cool thing, and this is the thing that I want people to sort of keep in mind when they're attacking something else, is that I didn't, I didn't create some sort of you know, domain-specific thing for this. I didn't say, OK, so when we So when we do something like do graphics drawing or something like that, we're not writing a bunch of code that's, OK, now we need to go and read everything about PDF to understand how it works. What we're literally doing here is we're going from Ruby to PDF in the object serialization. So when you look at this, you've got just a hash of arrays of strings. And when you look at the PDF object, that's exactly what you have. Now, really strongly consider this when you're working with a low-level format. If you take the lowest thing that you have and then wrap it in something that lets you write Ruby, you will write Ruby for the entire rest of the duration of your project, which of course is a good thing. Our entire PDF object generator is this. And I'm not expecting you to really memorize this or know this or anything, but it just is a, the, it's as simple as taking classes and then mapping them to their equivalent in another language. So what do I want you to get out of this? I'm not trying to convert everyone here to people who work on PDFs. Of course not. But I do want people to know that extensibility is not just important at the high level. If you approach some of the other PDF libraries we have out there, they assume that you've already read this spec. And we wanted to avoid that. And that's probably the reason why we have so many contributors on Prime. Another thing is that these developer APIs simplify the interactions with the low-level systems. It makes it so that you can have code that is not at the top level, but lower down in the system, that people can still meaningfully understand. You can wrap these things pretty easily and see things like you know, add content to page, meaningful methods. This is general good practices that we do when we're doing things like coding a Rails application or writing a small Ruby application. But it doesn't quite come natural when we're working with something so low level. We just end up generally running into a mess. And I mentioned it before, that wrapping your domain lets you focus on writing Ruby instead of writing whatever it is underneath. I mean, after the first few weeks of this, I sort of was able to forget about what the low level PDF constructs were. So long as I could sort of site recognize what kind of objects they were, I didn't need to know their particular syntax or anything like that, which really is a big win. So I'm now going to move on to uh, some of the nice fancy stuff. Now, how many people were here to see sort of like how to use Prompt instead of the underlying stuff? OK, a couple of you. So a problem that I had when forming this talk is I didn't think anyone used Prompt in production yet. But I was wrong, because apparently GitHub is using it for their invoices. Uh, of course, since real code is more fun and they neglected to leave the source code on their page, We'll reverse engineer it right now and hopefully not get sued. So this is what their invoice looks like. Fairly simple, but fairly standard. How many people have needs that look something in this realm? OK, awesome. So we're going to do it right now. And this is also valuable because it's looking at it out of the way that you might traditionally look at it. We're not looking at some code that already exists. We're looking at a document we want to reproduce. Now, I eyeballed this, but you could obviously do some direct calculations. So let's do it step by step. This is generating some text in Prawn. You don't need to position it. It will flow automatically if you want. So we're saying, OK, we're going to make an invoice slash receipt text. It's going to be size 24. It's going to be bold. We're using the default font, which is Helvetica. 
And we get that and we realize it's a little too high up on the page. So we set a larger top margin. And not perfect, but close enough. Now, what we want to do is we want to move down the page and then put that little bit of text that says, okay, account build, person's name, and then email address. And we do that. And now we get a little bit more fancy. We want to generate a table. In Prawn, tables are dirt simple. They are basically arrays of arrays of strings or cell objects, and you can mix and match the two. Now, setting headers is just a single array of headers. You can do things like set up fancy header alignment and things like that, but we'll start simple for now. Row colors are cycled over, and by default, if you don't specify a header color, it'll just use the first one for the header color and then walk over it. You're using HTML color codes for this, which I assume everyone here is familiar with. And we can align column-based things, so we can do things like that. But the one thing that you don't see here is you don't see a lot of complex objects for doing these things. How many people have worked with PDF Writer before? Okay, so does this look better than PDF Writer's tables? Yeah. Okay. So we do that, and that's our simple table, and we say, okay, well, they're not actually using the sort of fit it in the smallest areas you can, they're using you know, fixed widths for their columns. So we can go back and we can fix that. And I actually fixed the typo in the email here too. Just did a little things. Uh, there's a weird issue right now in Prawn that if you specify column widths, you have to set uh, the, the header alignment, which I'll look into. I found out about it last night. So it's not fixed yet and I wanted to give you code that actually runs. But what we also want to do is we want to align that text field to the right so it looks like that. And Right now we're looking pretty good. So the next step is to do a horizontal rule, which is trivial. We move down the page a little bit more and then Prawn has a function that you don't have to do you know, any calculations. You just say stroke horizontal rule and it'll go from the left boundary to the right boundary at the current Y position, no matter what your bounds are. So when we do that, we get this. Looking good so far? Okay, so the next thing, whoops, the next thing we want to do is we want to put these logos on there. Or, I'm sorry. Now we want to just put the addresses on here. That's just some more text, nothing special. At this point, what you might notice is that, yeah, we're giving some positions and telling it where to move and things like that, but we haven't done a whole lot of absolute positioning of things. And that's one of the nice things of working with Prawn is you'll probably tend to do less uh, calculations of coordinates, which anyone who's done any sort of graphic pro uh, processing or anything like that before knows that can be very painful. Okay, so we have the text, looks like that. And now we want to do something a little bit more fancy. We want to put the images on. But I decided I didn't want to use them locally. I wanted to just pull them from the web page. So our image support, that may be very low for you guys. Could you guys see the bottom line there? Okay, so the image support in Prawn, you could pass it just a file name or you could pass it any object that responds to read. And we're trying to follow that sort of approach. So if you use open URI and then you open the URL and you pass it in, works. So now we have the second image and we also do some things around with the scaling so that we end up with, I'm sorry, if you want to see that code for a little bit longer, we're basically, we add, I had some scaling things to make things the right size. And I added the second image, which you can use relative or absolute paths, either way. Uh, so then you end up with this. And looking at it on its own, is this convincing enough? Looks pretty similar? Okay, so don't go fishing with it, please. <laughs> but now I'd like to relax a little bit and really give us an opportunity to use whatever time we have left to either go over some examples that you guys are curious at looking at, talk about questions, things like that. Okay, so now we'll just go into sort of a question and answers, open discussion sort of thing, and I can answer whatever questions you have if you want to look at some code. If there's something easy you want me to demonstrate, I can do it. And so that's the URL, that's my blog, and we've got a lot of time to fill, so hopefully you'll have questions. Was everybody making 
contributed, coming from sort of a, the same kind of altruistic uh, place that you that you mentioned, or did you have like different folks looking at different things? Maybe some people actually did, maybe not have a you know specific requirement or a bounty out of you, but had an interest. I would say most of the people are just fixing things that they need for their job, and that's why I think it's awesome that you know we don't need this deep spirit of altruism in open source because if some people have it, some people don't. What happens, I mean, the, the reality... Sorry, just to clarify, I mean your, uh, your monetary contributors. Oh, uh, it's impossible for them to have a bounty out on things because I didn't specify what project I'd be working on previous. In fact, I didn't even have all of my ideas out until about halfway through the donation process. So these people are, yeah, those people, altruistic or at least trusting of me to produce something decent. Other questions? Are you uh, planning on doing this again or extending it? Uh, okay, so it was hard. Uh, it took up, it, it was difficult. It's the first time I, well, I've done other things like this. I mean, I've done Google Summer of Code. I've done CodeFest grants. James, James Gray and I worked on a sort of game framework for Ruby that never really came into anything. Uh, Ruby Central had funded that. And those are very different because basically someone's saying you're getting X amount of dollars and then you do this and it's part of a sponsored organization. It's totally different to ask people openly just to give you money. Um, and the thing is that I really sort of undershot how much money I would need. And the things like, I didn't count for travel. So when I wanted to do travel and things like that, I had to do consulting to fill it up, short things. I would love to do it again. I would rethink the way I did it. I, I made a pledge of hours, which apparently no one cares about, but I'm only about 78% maybe through that. I don't, that's just a random statistic, but around there, around three quarters of the way through. And you can't track an open source project like you do billing of a contract. You know, it's, it's hard. There's a lot of things I'd have to think about before I did it again. But I think that it was a success because we've got lots and lots of people using this just out of the box and it's allowing people to migrate from other software so I think that's a win. And I would be happy to talk with or help other people with doing this sort of thing. Okay. Dave? Question. One of the features that um, I'm using right now in PDF Writer is it allows you to capture um, a PDF into a context and then use it multiple times. So I'd basically create, like, in, in our particular case, um, there's a loophole in customs documentation when you ship books internationally. They say you need two invoices to accompany it, but they don't say it has to go two separate pieces of paper. So I should generate one invoice, rotate it, scale it, and then put two side by side. Will the problem let me do that? Probably not. Because... That, that loophole, are you talking about how you could serialize? Basically, I'll, I see I've created context for a PDF, for, for a, a drawing, mm -hmm. and then draw into it, and then just reuse it. Yeah, see, the way that that worked in PDF Writer is you were able to marshal it out to disk and then um, pull it back in later, and then add. Is that, is that what you're talking about? Uh, I don't know how to cover I just, I just, I just like. So the, the, the concern is that product keeps a bunch of procs all over the place. Uh, but we can, we can talk about that. I, I think this is something we need to do some sort of feature comparison, but if you want to catch me after this, we can talk about it a little bit. Other questions? No, there's nothing in Ruby that does it, so I don't even have a, something that I can look at. There's, you can do that with Perl. So, I mean, if you're not aversive of you know, running a shell script and then doing some merging between documents, you could do it that way. But I, I want that feature, but it turns out to be hard because you need to be able to fully process the PDF to meaningfully do it. Because if we go, like, let me try and pull up my slides again. Uh, 
All right, so. I mean, maybe it's just come, I'm coming from a Perl background. I feel like the Perl solution might be lighter. But I mean, yeah, that's, that's the, the situation right now that, because it's external. But I mean, the, the problem with, let me back up one more slide. The problem with doing that in PDF is that you've got this cross-reference table. And this, what this does, I kind of glossed over it before, but it tells you exactly where every object is in a PDF. And so in order to add things into it, like into different pages and things like that, we'd have to update the cross-reference table. In order to meaningfully do that, we would either have to find a sensible way to stub out all of the objects and sort of ignore them and then inject inwards, you know, just picking up just their lengths, or we would have to fully parse the PDF. And PDF Reader has come a very long way. It's very cool. And if people are interested in how to test your PDFs and stuff, I could show that stuff. But we're not there yet. Uh, People with interest in it, I would support it for sure because it's one of the most common requested features, but we stayed far away from it because it's hard. And hard in a different way than some of this other stuff. Other questions? Okay. Um, so what I can do if people kind of don't know what to ask, what, we have until what, two o'clock or two o'clock? Okay. So I could show a couple other examples that show some of the sort of more advanced stuff in Prawn because what we didn't see in this was we didn't see anything that was multi-page documents. We didn't see uh, anything that required you to position things in a particular way or anything like that. So I can show you some of that stuff. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so here we're using, we're playing around with these things called bounding boxes. Now, how many people came into this familiar with Prawn somewhat? Okay, not many. So Prawn fixes a lot of the issues with positioning things on documents by allowing you to box off and then remap the origin in different places of your document. So you can do a whole lot of relative positioning without you know, doing absolute positioning in calculations. So here's, from that example, what we did is we said, okay, uh, we're going to place a bounding box. The top left corner of it is going to be 100 you know, over from the left and 600 up from the bottom, and it's going to be a width 200. We're going to flow some text inside of it, and then we're going to draw some lines. And the, we made an X by you know, going from the top left to the top right of that box, and then the bottom left to the bottom right. So then we do another bounding box that has the circle and then the X through that. And Inside of that, you can see that you can nest them. And when you nest these bounding boxes, they're, they're relative to the one that it was nested in. So you can see in this code, there is absolutely no absolute positioning going on. And just to show that example again, we get something like that. Now, does that seem Interesting to people? Do anyone have any questions about how the bounding box stuff works? Okay. So, other things we have are built in UTF 8 support. Uh, it just, just works. And another thing that I should mention is that. All of this stuff is going to work on Ruby 1.9 and Ruby 1.8 because we wrote Prawn on Ruby 1.9. So you can move forward with it. And you can get those speed enhancements and things like that. And because Prawn will eventually become part of Ruby reports, Ruport, since faster CSV is now 1.9 compatible, will quickly move up there too. So if you're using this sort of stuff, you can bring it on when you want to migrate to 1.9. So 
you don't need to do anything special with uh, your, as long as you pass UTF-8 strings, they just, oh, I should add a open at the bottom of here. They just work. Wrapping works, all of this stuff works. This is Greek. Uh, the key here is that you need to, it only works for the true type fonts. So you need to have a font that supports whatever language that you're working in and things like that, but you shouldn't need to do anything special. So if you've got needs for you know, multilingualization and things like that, it's pretty nice. Now, Prawn will convert your code uh, to, it expects that your code will be in UTF-8 if you're on Ruby 1.8. On Ruby 1.9, you can pass in anything that's in any encoding that can be converted to Unicode, and it'll do it for you. It's going to transcode it, which is um, not a fully robust model, but it works pretty good for most cases. So other things. OK, so there's this concept of spans. And a span is sort of like a simplified bounding box that allows you to flow text in a column. And these things, you basically you give them a width and then a position. You can position it relatively you know, centering or you know, whatever you want to do. And Okay, so this is text flowing in a column, and then here's some text in a bounding box, and when you use spans in a bounding box, you have to do something uh, a little bit tricky, because they're not really meant to be used that way, because the difference between a span and a bounding box in Prawn is that if you flow to the bottom of a bounding box with text, it will bring you to the next page, but it's going to put the text at the top left corner of that bounding box wherever you put it. So that often becomes a problem for people because that's not what they want. So when you do work with spans within a bounding box, you have to offset them from the margin because that's how they always work regardless if they're inside. So they don't nest like bounding boxes do. But you can see that we're just very easily flowing text in a column, centered, and doing things like that. Let's see. OK, so images don't need to be absolutely positioned. This is another sort of cool thing. So here we're just saying, OK, from the current Y position, go to the center of the page, right, left, again. And if you don't put anything at all, it just puts it flush with the left edge of wherever you are at your Y position. Oh, what happened there? Something is broken with that. OK, that was broken this weekend during the Hackfest, I think. I'll fix it. But OK, so after seeing some of that stuff, are any other questions kind of coming up? Or OK. Yes, I'll, I'll show that. OK, so this is just a bunch of content. You can see that you can use UTF-8 strings inside of all of that other stuff. You can set, this is, has a lot more options than the other ones, so you can set the padding and things like that for builds and So that's a table meaningfully flowing across pages. It'll just repeat the headers and just start off where you left off on the next page. And you can actually flow them within a bounding box, too. So you can sort of subsection an area of your document and you say, OK, I only want it to be this size. Now, when you make a bounding box, what you're doing is you're sort of 
pretending that you're moving the margins on the document temporarily inside of that block, and then doing everything relative to that. And it turns out to be really, really handy. That's one of the main things that I like about Prawn. So there's also some sort of interesting things with the way that we do fonts and things. There's, Prawn has all of this stuff that is sort of like, you've got these blocks and they do something just for that block. So you can apply some parameters here. So this is all sorts of ways of dealing with fonts. You can manually set everything. You can say, okay, I'm just gonna set the font size just for this area and then you could override it in there. This is just setting new defaults. Uh, or you can just specify everything all at once, the styles, everything like that, and then use all of the stuff nested inside and it all just works. So that's that. Now, since we only have like two minutes left, that's all I have. I'll throw this page with the URL on it up again. There. There you go. So any last questions before we get out of here? Cool. Well, I'm leaving now, so I won't be around the conference anymore, unfortunately. But please get in touch. Prawn is a really, really approachable project. It's got a lot of great people doing casual contributions, some people getting a little bit more active than that. We're always active on IRC and you know the mailing list and things like that. And I'm more than happy, even if you're not looking to contribute directly, I'm more than happy to help look over some projects that you're working on and try and improve things, make it easier for you. And I've still got a couple hours, well, quite a bit of hours left to finish up on this for the Mendicant project, so that means sort of like I've got some dedicated time to help work on your problems. So that's pretty cool. So that's my talk. Thank you.